your lives. All right, everybody. This is episode 19 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your hosts, Brett and CH. Topics today, we have Microsoft is building a decentralized identity system on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Pretty legit. Uh, we had a flash crash a couple of days ago. We'll talk about that. It looks like a lot of people got liquidated. It sucks. Um, and also, the, uh, the global liquidity bubble seems to keep going. Uh, Jesse Colombo had a, had a great tweet storm as he usually does on, on this topic. So, you know, we'll cover, we'll cover a little bit of that and uh, bring it back into Bitcoin. But yeah, it's been an awesome week and weekend so far, Brett, but how you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, things are getting interesting. <laughs> again, it's, uh, I think there's more people interested in Bitcoin again. I think there's 60 Minutes tonight has Charlie Shrem, right, on Bitcoin. It's going to yeah. be pretty interesting. That's going to... Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was saying it's, you know, they got Charlie Shrem and Laszlo uh, Hanyich, the guy who uh, pretty much invented GPU mining and uh, was the is the Bitcoin pizza guy. Spent 10,000 Bitcoins on two pizzas in 2010. Um, it's awesome. So he's going to be on there. I don't I, I don't have high hopes for the 60 Minutes episode, but, uh, you know, maybe a couple of million normies will will see it tonight. I mean, that episode airs in like an hour and 20 minutes. So uh, if we get text messages next week, I would not be surprised. Yeah, it, um, there's more and more like people inquiring about it. It's basically what's going on. And as you've said before, uh, you say it all the time, it's price drives adoption and you couldn't be more right. People get more interested as the price goes up. Price goes down. No one's talking about it over here. Like December, like when we started the podcast, no one was talking about it. <laughs> and all this, you know, it's going to come back. It, you know, like the, it's getting retarded again, so I'm going to say. That's the only way to describe it. Yeah, I mean. It's, it's impervious. Uh, it's doing mm -hmm. the impervious moves again. That's what's. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's funny because, and I know price. <laughs> I, I know I know price drives adoption because when I was stacking sats under 4k I wasn't stacking nearly as much sats as I was stacking you know a couple of weeks later once we broke above 4k and then broke above 5k I'm like oh shit you know here we go again I better I better start stacking again because you never know if you're going to see four digit Bitcoin again and uh, yeah so I, I can see from my own experience that that price drives adoption and it it's not a surprise if they were holding back on this 60 minutes um show for weeks or months now you don't know when they recorded it yeah they could have been they could have been waiting for a pump and then they throw it in there i mean you never know yeah that's it's very interesting that's i didn't think about that um it's again as you said like who knows but it's getting you're getting like i'm getting the text messages again and it's like and it's as i've said before like the impervious moves like in in 20 like if like it just kind of rejects bottoms like earlier you know i mean we're back and i granted like things could change obviously but it's doing what it did the other time before like and as people say maybe like was it capital outflows is that what it is Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean it's and that senator mentioning how basically Bitcoin makes the US dollar system useless in terms of a like financial weapon because you can send money around. And so that's another question. Are are other countries buying this? Who's buying it? Because it's you know, what I mean, like who's I mean someone like obviously someone's driving the price up. So what what's you know? more buyers or something because it's been it's going pretty retarded yeah i mean it goes with the same thing price drives adoption uh adoption comes in 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 different use cases um whether it be only speculation now you have microsoft's decentralized identity protocol that they're working on then you have the realization that um, sanctions can be avoided by by using bitcoin and you don't really start putting the pieces of that puzzle together until the price gets high enough where people actually care enough to use it. So people could have been avoiding sanctions since 
uh, January of 2009 using Bitcoin, but it, it, it didn't even have a price. So, you know, you need that market to mature. And uh, we'll talk more about um, the, the infrastructure maturing later when we talk about the flash crash. But um, yeah, the, the use cases will come. And right now, it's really just speculation and storing your wealth if you think that Bitcoin's a, a good store of value for you right now. Those are, those are the two main use cases right now. Um, but why don't we jump into the uh, Microsoft decentralized identity? So uh, I wanted to talk about this because I listened to uh, one of Peter McCormack's podcast episodes that just came out maybe a week or so ago or a couple days ago with, uh, with Daniel B, a.k.a. CSU Wildcat, and he works on the Decentralized Identity Project at Microsoft. And he's been working with the Decentralized Identity Foundation for a long time. And he talked a lot about how um, the culture of Microsoft is starting to change and shift towards thinking about open source projects first. Uh, they were one of the top contributors to, to Linux in 2018, I believe. Um, and now you can see them start to about start to build on top of Bitcoin. And they're trying to build this uh, decentralized identity platform. And it's, it, it's considered a, a layer two solution. And uh, similar to like the Lightning Network or uh, or maybe a side chain, um, and the the point that he was trying to make on the podcast was that there's going to be new ways to monetize by using Bitcoin, but we still need more infrastructure to be built up first. So it's like saying um, it's you know, prior to HTTP becoming mainstream and trying to think about how do you build, uh, how do you build Amazon before that? Well, you can't, you need, uh, all the infrastructure to be built and then you can start building new businesses, new use cases and whatever else on top of that. And I think we're going to see more of that in the, in the decade or so to come, but you really need that infrastructure layer to be built first. You know, you need lightning working very well and it needs to be really easy to use and, you know, not dealing with channel management and all this other stuff. And then you need this identity layer and they're they're taking bits and pieces of um, other pieces of software to make that decentralized identity solution easier for the mainstream person to use. So you can um, you can split your keys up, maybe three of five, and you can you can share those keys with your. Um, your web of trust, right? Maybe I could send one to Brett. I could send one to uh, a friend in another state and, and so on and so forth. And if I ever lose two of my keys, I can, I can help regenerate those, that identity set from, from the other people who are holding my other keys. And I, I can trust that they won't uh, collude together to have enough keys to, you know, fake my identity or whatever. But I think you're going to be able to see new use cases and businesses built on top of that. So imagine any marketplace that we use today, right? We all use Uber, we all use Airbnb, um, but we have to give up a lot of our identity to participate in that marketplace, which it's a centralized service, um, completely understandable. I understand why so much of your identity needs to be given up, but does it really have to be? And I think that's the question we're going to start asking. And I think if you see more of the... Uh, the cyber attacks happen where, you know, Airbnb gives up all of this identity because of a hack. People are going to start thinking twice about giving up so much of their privacy. And now with this solution, you may not have to give up as much as your privacy as you used to in order to participate in the same products and services. But what do you think? How do you think, uh, what types of services do you think can be built on top of this decentralized identity? How, how will it change the way we interact today? Um, all I gotta say is Vinny Liam. <laughs> Civic. Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Civic's in here? I see the, the Bitcoin thing, but yo. Civic. Vinny Lingham. That's hilarious. There's Casa too, but I think that's hilarious that Civic's in here. 
Yeah, I mean, they've been trying to do this, and they realized they couldn't. Um, yeah, I like that Casa is uh, Casa's doing that. So you can start to use that decentralized identity layer with your with your Casa node or your, your full node at home. It's got me really excited. I just think there's a lot to do with that, and a lot of use cases and business models that we currently use today will start to change in the in the next in the years to come you know i i couldn't even predict how it would look but it will definitely look different and hopefully be super easy to use yeah i mean civics is shit coin i'm just i just pulled the chart sorry i just love it but um i think that's pretty funny that they're even mentioned there i just I think it's hilarious but anyways it's pretty interesting I mean, you know a lot more about this stuff than I do, and but this is definitely, I don't know, a little spooky to me, but because it's Microsoft, but right, no, I, no I'm a little, I'm a little that's sketch. A that's a, the whole time you talk, I'm a little sketch. The more I read into this, I'm like, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it's a good point. How do you get the trust back from, uh, you know, someone that you think has maybe abused that trust in the past? And I think if Microsoft's heading in the direction that at least it seems they are, they might be trying to take another crack at being a big powerhouse in the decades to come and realizing that they cannot build the walled garden around this ecosystem. I mean, what they, I mean, they tried this, right? They tried to, uh, do this in the nineties and get everybody onto their version of an intranet or whatever and charge for it and you know that didn't work so i think the the light bulb's going off that we need to build on free open source tools and then figure out how to monetize after that you know we need to pick everybody up and move them onto a new platform yeah so and I've... and they need to do it voluntarily right like I, i'm gonna try this for sure this is great i i hate that if i'm using uh, google or something and they have and I sign into something else with Google, the their API is giving up uh, all of my information I hate from it. there, right? Like all of it. Every time I, I hate it, I can't, email. you yeah. can't have Gmail open on your fucking thing. You open Gmail and they're like, oh, now I'm just logged in searching everything on my Gmail. Yeah, Fucked. I mean, I uh, I ended up switching to the Dissenter browser, which is a, a fork of Brave and uh, Gab is the... Uh, the mastermind behind that they're just forking open source software and they're going to start implementing um, Bitcoin and lightning network into it. But dude, it is awesome. I love, love the dissenter browser. It's great. It's super lightweight. I don't feel that my privacy is being infringed upon. Um, it uses DuckDuckGo as like the, the basic search engine, which, you know, it's not as robust as um, Google, but you can see the difference in the search results for sure. It's a, uh, it's definitely better. I do. I do like it, and I will recommend it to people. Can I, can I just say one thing? Um, I don't know if Microsoft having access to everyone's identity is the best thing in the world. Well, I, how are they going to know that it's you? I think that's kind of the. Uh, I don't. I don't I know don't, that it's going to be like. A, yeah, I don't know. Like Maybe when I, you're. I'm a skeptical I, person. I'm sorry. So no. Yeah, and I think it's it's healthy to be skeptical, and I think that. Now, more than ever, you have the people who are, let's face it, the people who are really working on Bitcoin and trying to make sure that it survives are a privacy first. And they always have been and they always will be. And if it's not privacy first, people will be kicking and screaming all over Twitter that to not use this, basically. And since it's all open source, it'll just be forked anyway and then re-implemented. So I'm, I'm less concerned with uh, Microsoft building a moat around people's identity because they're now focused on all open source. So I know that I can't go and look into that and say, oh, here's a here's an obvious bug or they're taking my privacy this and storing it in these servers. But you have the the other developers of the world who know much more about it who can go and do that verification for um, the rest of the community, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, and if not, like your shit will get forked and everybody will move over and that's how it goes. Um, the, 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 the game has totally changed. Like the, the, uh, the pieces of the game have changed and now you can just fork projects and crush, crush them, 
which is nice. But I, I hear what you're saying. We we definitely need to be skeptical of anything that your typical Apple, Google, Microsoft, um, or any other, or Facebook, yeah, Instagram, anybody's that's been storing data for the last decade. Like you got to really think twice about it. Yeah, because you really do. Yeah, no, it's bad. It's like there is no privacy. <laughs> that's if you don't understand. Right. It's we gotten gotta get so it bad. No, it's like no, it's like so bad. It yeah. really it 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 is like just so bad to be and I, I don't mean I just mean to reiterate it twenty times. But I do because that's where it's at. Yeah, and I think um you know, and it's it sucks because for for you and I, that privacy that privacy might be gone already. Um <laughs> but maybe for the kids being born today. By the time they're using whatever the version of social media looks like, if such a thing still exists in a decade from now, they hopefully won't have their privacy infringed upon as much or at all compared to what you and I have had to go through. And I mean, don't get me wrong, you and I gave it up voluntarily and willingly because it's super convenient and it's the only way to get anything done right now. Like you have to be willing to give up some of that privacy or else you can't really participate. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I hope that that looks very different, um, you know, for the kids being born today. Maybe, you know, my kids, hopefully someday they won't have to deal with having their fucking iCloud uh, photographs downloaded and, and hacked into and then held for ransom. You know, it's like I, I want all of that to start to go away. And, uh, you know, it might be too late for me and you, but for the next generation, uh Hopefully, we can do a really good job of building tools that they can use that will just kind of make all that stuff so irrelevant. I hope. Yeah, I would hope so. Uh, the, the, the path isn't, the direction isn't there yet. We're still pretty bad. Uh, I would hope so, though. We're getting there. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, man. It's I only mean, getting worse, though, I feel like right now because of, and you know, more of like a, and I guess both. Just think about how much shit we use that just is, I don't mean shit, but like, we talk about your phone, um, even like, you know, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. Um, it's just bad at email. Like, it's bad. Yeah. And I think as it gets easier for the average person or the normie to, you know, like if they wanted to use something like Proton Mail or they wanted to use uh, the yeah. Decenter browser or they want to browse over Tor they need to be doing that in a way where that they don't know that they're doing that. Like the privacy is just built in right away. You and I can go and sign up for Proton Mail and use Gab and Decenter and whatever. And that's great because we have, we're slightly more technical. It's not that big of a deal to go and realize that it's important. But you know, for the average person who uses WhatsApp, they don't know that it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Like they don't, they don't know that. They don't even care. But the the privacy has been built in for them and they don't even need to know about it. And uh, that's something that Beautyon talks about on Twitter a lot. Like all of this is going to work for the normies and they're they're not even going to know all the trials and tribulations that you and I had to go through to even get there. Yeah. Um, so like it just needs to get that much better. Yeah, no, you're, you're completely right about that. The average person doesn't either A, know how to or they just... um don't care it's 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 a combination of both because there's just some people it's just technically as you said i mean i'm not super computer nerd or anything i mean i i kind of know my way around computer like it's just like kind of willing to learn type of thing and some people just don't care it's, you know what i mean Sometimes. oh i totally get what you mean my dad used to help me install computer programs on floppy disks as a kid and now he calls me for computer help and I'm, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that technical. Like, you know, I'm trying to yeah. learn how to code. I, um, I can, I can record this podcast. I can edit stuff in final cut. I can make memes on Photoshop. Uh, like I'm technical enough that I can make my way around a computer, but then there's totally different levels of, um, expertise. And I think it's, it's going to be, it's going to be like on your resume being proficient in word or PowerPoint or Excel. It'll be proficient in, um, you know, writing some basic Python or just other stuff where it's going to be that next generation of kids are just going to have to learn. It'll be really normal and natural because they're going to be, uh, 
native to the internet and just born with it already working, which is totally different, right? Like I, re I remember a time when like I didn't have internet on my phone, like it wasn't there. And I was just talking about that with my <laughs> wife, actually. I was like, you and I grew up like, I remember the day my mom got a Blackberry and I was, I was on it and I was, uh, I love cars and I was on the Lancer Evo forums and I was like, holy shit, like you can get on the internet on this phone. I was like, I can talk to my friends in the forums. And that was so mind blowing. And I want to say that was 2006 ish. That's and then, uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then like 2007 came out and I was like, clearly I, I like wanted to get an iPhone. So I got one and I was like, and it was a total game changer from there. But I still had, you know, that whole up until I was, you know, from birth up until that day, I didn't have access to the internet in my pocket like 24 seven. And that's like not that long ago, dude, 12 years ago. It really wasn't that long ago. So it's just a whole new wave of people like things, things fucking change. Everybody says things don't change. But when you look back, a ton has changed. So when someone tries to make the argument that you know, nobody will ever use Bitcoin as money or whatever, I'm like, well, there was a time when everybody used gold as money and it backed our currency. And now you live in a time where you didn't even know that that was a thing. And it's just paper money and nobody thinks twice about it. So like things do change. It's just like it's not obvious until you get there. Yeah, it's it's bad. And it's clear it's clear that I think people understand there's an alternative. Something's coming soon. I don't know what. Something's changing soon though. Because uh I think it's just as people, as we know, I guess fiat currencies are out of control right now. And it's gonna be exposed very shortly. Like there's just no way around it. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of sleight of hand with fiat money. Um, and we'll talk more about that for the global liquidity bubble. A lot of, it paints a lot of parallels there. But it's like for you and I living in the United States, fiat's never given me that much of an issue. It works. I can pay for pretty much anything, anywhere, at any time, very quickly. Uh, but what I don't notice is that prices have increased and we've seen inflation uh, at various levels across different asset classes and, and things that sit into that um, CPI basket. So while I might not be upset that um, movie tickets are cost 50% more than they did 15 years ago, um, real estate prices are maybe up two or 300, 400% in some areas. So you see the, that inflation sitting in different asset classes and you see like the, you know, the pump in the S and P over the last uh, two decades, you know, the inflation might not be when you're going and buying meat at the grocery store, but you can see it in other places. But it's hard to notice because we don't think about it on a consistent basis. Whereas if your credit card was getting declined like once a week or more often than that or whatever, you would notice. Or if you lived in Argentina or or um, Zimbabwe or Iran where the currency is hyperinflating, trust me, you'd, you'd know that there's, uh, there's an issue with fiat occasionally and that it can lead to some really shitty times. Yeah, I mean, either way, yeah, there's, there's asset inflation. It's as simple as that. Oh, dealing from gold? It's like, where'd all the money go? Assets, you know. Right, right, right. And, you that that store of value kind of went away and then you need to look for that same thing in other assets. Yeah. And so now, you know, what happens as this unwinds? That's the real question. I don't know. You know, now that we're talking about it, why don't we talk about the global liquidity bubble now since we're yeah, kind, we're of, kind on of, that, of on that topic? Might as well go into that. Um, so Jesse Colombo and if you guys don't follow him, it's definitely worth reading some of his uh, some of his work. It's it's fantastic. He's a sound money guy, totally understands Austrian economics, um, and he was talking about that. There were two record two records made in the past week: ninety one million dollars for a rabbit sculpture, sculpture um, and that set the record for the highest amount paid for a piece of art by a living artist. And then Monet's uh, a, a work of art from Monet. 100, 111 million, pretty much, and that set the record for impressionist work. And uh, it's a little crazy. That's a shitload. And 
I just, I mean, if, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the, the rabbit sculpture. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's cool, but I could probably order the same thing on AliExpress for like 20 bucks and <laughs> get it in 30 days. Like the, the substitute goods that you could have instead, it just doesn't really make sense to me. But Jesse was talking about um, that this has pretty much happened before. And to understand today's art bubble, you can look at the Japan driven art bubble from the late eighties, um, that pretty much went up in flames and Japanese business people and corporations were, uh, were using their balance sheet to, to speculate on art and just bidding it up. So we have seen this before history does not always repeat, but it certainly does rhyme. And in this case, uh, you know, today in 2019, you are seeing these other assets inflate and weird assets like artwork, uh, modern art, things like this rabbit sculpture going for $91 million. Um, it's, it's mind blowing, uh, that, that is accumulating some sort of wealth and you can see people, someone's storing their wealth in that rabbit. You know, they just paid 91 million for it. You wouldn't do that for something to just throw in the trash. Like you, you would, you would speculate on that or hold your wealth in that for a reason. Um, a reason that I'm not really sure of, but I think you can start to see how that looks like malinvestment because you have very cheap credit from fiat money and that causes distortions in the marketplace. And now you have um, people speculating on things that shouldn't really be speculated on in that way because they can't get yield anywhere else. So you have weird stuff like art being bubbled up. And uh, it's it's a symptom of fiat money, to be honest with you. And it, it can't really be more obvious than that. Uh, there's no there's no other analysis necessary to understand why someone would pay ninety one million dollars for a rabbit. Dude, that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> right, you like can, you don't have to think you, about it. You could buy you could buy. I think the McLaren F one was like twenty worth twenty million now. You could buy four of those. <laughs> Practically, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'd, rather have the, I'd rather have the McLaren for sure. <laughs> like, I just had to get something because that's the most like I, I know most people aren't car enthusiasts, but this is like the most probably absurd car in the world, one of the coolest. But it's like it's an insane price, and obviously, Fiat money drives that, but still, comparatively to a fucking rabbit, <laughs> I just had to get something else absurd. And you yeah. get you could get four and a half of those pretty much. So. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you would have asked me like three years ago, I would be taking profits and buying like exotic cars or something, uh, something like that. I think now my time preference yeah. has been lowered so much because of Bitcoin um, that I'll delay that purchase another decade, <laughs> another decade. Or if I'm making a ton of money from a fiat paying job. Uh, maybe I'd consider leasing something really dope someday. You know what I would lease? I just saw it. <laughs> uh, I saw it yesterday on quick side uh, topic. Have you seen the uh, the Rivian like electric trucks? No. All right. Well, this one was pretty sweet, and it had um. They're fast. They're stupid fast. They're like a three seconds zero to sixty, and they have a grill built in inside the truck that you can like pull out. It's really dope. Um. And I think cars are going to look really cool in the next decade, um, regardless of what powers them. I think we're going to see some really cool shit. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe I would get something cool or, like that. Or no least... cars are made. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't even have a car anymore. Like that's how crazy my time preference is now. Like I got, I sold all my cars. I walk everywhere. Um, like I, I can't. Oh, there's this the, the Simpsons piece of artwork. All right, so that one went. This is another one, another, another symptom of fiat money. Um, somebody in Hong Kong paid $28 million for that, for that uh, Simpsons piece of artwork. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the Simpsons. It's not that, but... $21 I'm million? Certain, dollars? I'm certainly not going to pay twenty. million. I'll, I'll get a poster of that at the mall for like 10 bucks if I really wanted to hang it somewhere. That's insane. Yeah. But like how... 
how skewed does fiat money get that you that you would want to spend on that like you couldn't have thought of anything else no like uh, that's ins- it's that's insane like and that's where we've gotten that's what time's gotten it's just getting and every it's just everything's getting off the scale <clears throat> but here again no one's paying attention yeah so if you're <clears throat> listening to this podcast at all i and i and i, I hope that this makes a little bit of sense that this should be like a little bit of a, a trigger or a warning sign that like, yeah, that is a little weird. Why would somebody pay $28 million for a Simpsons piece of artwork? Um, that maybe the, the money that we're using to pay for these things, maybe something's going, going on with that. Um, and of course, you know, you don't, you don't know until it's happened and we can look back in hindsight and say, ah, you know, we were right. How obvious the, uh, you print a bunch of fiat money, via quantitative easing and cheap credit and and a ton of loans like you you get these distortions in the in the marketplace and it it will look really obvious in hindsight um but it's too obvious to me now but and we we say this all the time like the market can stay irrational longer than i can stay solvent so i could i could um go to cash for all of my uh you know, equity investments and be like, oh, the crash is coming. I'm going to be right. And then I could be wrong for a few more years. And, and who am I, I might be right eventually, but I could be wrong in the short term. And that's where, uh, well, fiat money always comes to an end eventually. You just never really know when, but it just, it looks weird right now. Yeah. Everything is just distorted <clears throat> and it's getting bad because like, uh, someone made a valid point, like on Twitter. I saw like something about I can't remember who, who tweeted it, but like the average American doesn't have a thousand dollars in a savings account, and then you think about the average like share of a like a U.S. like equity, like sixty, seventy, hundred dollars, three hundred, four hundred dollars. So they can buy what a share, maybe two shares, and that's what that's the issue with this. Like, I love when people talk about like how many Americans actually aren't participating in the stock market. Right. It's, and it's a, it's a, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like a big deal. Yeah. I mean, another thing on the liquidity bubble that I noticed that the, and, and you can probably talk more about this is the auto loan growth for borrowers with a credit score below 660 now appears to be higher than the growth of borrowers with uh, scores above 660. And I guess that means that auto dealers are, are lowering their lending standards to uh, possibly be making up for weaker sales. And that, that could lead to, because of the lower scores, you would, you would say, okay, well that might lead to increase in delinquency rates. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, and it's already a known thing. Auto loan delinquencies are getting ridiculous. It's like auto loan debt now is like over one, in like, like one, 1.1 1. 1 trillion. It's getting, it's big. Um, it's like pretty close to student loans. Student loans is now, I think 1.6 trillion. But um, it's getting pretty ridiculous here. And this is, as you can see on the screen here, asset and credit bubbles form during low interest rates. And you can see it perfectly, housingbubble.com bubble. And then obviously QE and ZERP, which has just been so long. And that's what makes this so scary. This wasn't like a year. This wasn't like three or four years. This was 2009 all the way to 2016 when they barely rose rates. And then like early 2017, they started rising. It's pretty insane to say the least. Uh, and then you look at the central bank's balance sheets. Um, that's the scary thing. Like the Bank of Japan owns 50% of the Nikkei 225. And ba- Japan's like on the verge of recession. I think I saw something about that. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, the, and the real estate prices in, in uh, Tokyo. Tokyo. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, dude, real estate in Tokyo is wild from what I hear. And like, if you think New York City is bad or Manhattan or San Francisco, like it's it's uh it's pretty wild there. And the same thing in Sydney and uh, Toronto, it seems. So it's it's not like there aren't signs. And I I, I don't remember twenty two thousand and eight well enough. It's not like I was looking to buy a home or anything to be like, oh yeah, the the home market's like dropping a bit, and then. As it is right now, you know, this is the first time we've ever seen some month over month um, 
decreases in uh, real estate prices, at least here in the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, is, is, is that a, will, in hindsight, will that look like, a, oh, you know, it's, it started, you know, in the beginning of 2019 or the end of 2018, whatever, uh, you know, we won't know till it's over, but it's, um, it, it seems that way, at least in other, in other countries, which is, um, it's nice for me to see that because it, it at least makes sense. I can, I can look globally and say, okay, it's not an isolated incident here. Let's see, this makes, this is the uh, New York, like NYSE composite, New York Stock Exchange composite. It hasn't made a new high since the start of 2018. So like, that's the reality of the stock market. Like things aren't making new highs. We'll see mm. what happens, but I mean, obviously dude, like if it wasn't for the Fed turn around here, that was it, but there we go. Um, like, look at that. <laughs> Yeah, that was. I mean, I, I had a, uh, I had a friend who was looking to get pre-approved for a mortgage in in New Jersey, and uh, you know, surprisingly, they said like, you might want to hang tight before you buy this house, and the reasoning was because it felt, you know, like another market bubble, which seems I I would be surprised that a, a mortgage lender would even be telling somebody that. Um, it was very nice of them to let. A young millennial know that they might be buying someone's bags, their real estate bags. Uh, so uh, again, you know, we're not going to know till it's over. But I'm really glad that I sold my house last year, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, no, um, I think you're 100 percent right there. Like, I don't think there's any chance home prices are going to stay up because everything's going to go kaput. Um, and the market, the, like the equities market will lead it down just like it always has done for the last few decades here. Yeah. Or I guess forever really, but, but here it's, you know, like 2000, look how bad 2007 was. I don't even, oh, yeah. I don't know where we go here. It could get bad. Yeah. There's so much stupid tension right now that no one's talking about like China with the trade war, the trade war, there's no trade deal. No one's talking about this. Everyone's just, oh, we're all really complacent that there's no trade deal. Like, that's a fucking big deal. There's all these tariffs going up. Like, it's going to drive inflation. Yeah, and, and th that's going to be interesting to watch. Like, China's preparing its people, basically, to, like, deal with, like, higher prices and other shit like that. Like, it's a whole political thing. It's fucked. Yeah, it's scary. Um, but like it is, it is, it is what it is. Um, yeah. we can only, we can only talk about it, watch it, uh, defend ourselves against it. Right. I mean, that's why we like this stuff so much because it's, it's like a, it's like watching this puzzle getting put together and you need to figure out where you sit on that board and, uh, and try to protect, protect yourself, I guess. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to read this other tweet that I found from this guy, Ben Prentice. Uh, he's a Bitcoiner and it, it's, it's on the same topic with just the whole fiat money distortion. And he said, we don't realize yet how a liquid store of value money will change the world. Prices of everything will decline. Everything will be more affordable in due time. Our time preference will shift to consider the future. Productivity improvements will be shared by all. Right now, the only store of value we have is inflating assets. These assets have economic and investment use that has been hijacked for monetary store of value use. I'll talk about that in a second. The discrepancy between these uses introduces volatility for both monetary and economic cases, destroying both. And then he says, the constant search for store of value under the guise of investment to beat inflation has diverted our attention away from real productive activities. Vacant zombie houses emerge in dense cities and drive housing and real and real tenants through the roof while the wealthy profit. So that's really interesting. And that goes right back to what we're talking about, that you're seeing the inflation in asset prices. And I, I see this because I, I, you know, I, I do see this in the Bay Area. Um, you have investors, foreign investors coming and buying a ton of real estate and it's just sitting vacant for the majority of the year. Why? Because 
that's the best way that they can store their wealth today. They are doing exactly what they need to do to try to make sure that the that money, if it were sitting in their fiat currency, doesn't get inflated away. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to buy some real estate in Manhattan and San Francisco and play the long game. And you're seeing that store value function that a, a good money typically would serve, and it's going into other things like asset prices. And uh, I have a feeling that as if, well, when we see a a true store of value with a monetary uh, use case, that the uh, the investment that's gone to these other assets to be used as a store of value will be repriced and that will shift back over to a, an actual store of value um, that, that that's in a, a, a money. Yeah, I was in something about the auto loans um, being like they're almost their highest is Q whatever 120. It says I think Q something 2011. Um, basically, What's going on with that is like, and I saw a chart the other day and that summed it up pretty well. It's like Americans are driving older and older cars now. And it's so true. In, in most areas, Americans are driving a lot older vehicles. You see it everywhere too. Um, obviously in like wealthier areas or cities, you'll see less of it. But like in regular America, people are driving a lot older vehicles. Yeah, for sure. I mean... The, the turnover on vehicles isn't that high. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's almost like the same thing with my phone. Like I have an iPhone 10 and I didn't upgrade this past year, even though every year before that, I always get the new phone anyway, because I, I like having new shit. Uh, you know, it's a vice that I have. And I'm like, well, why am I going to even upgrade, you know? And it's the same thing with a car. You have people who are like, damn, man, like, am I really going to get into a $500 a month car payment for you know, whatever. Yeah, no, it's, 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 is it worth it? Uh, yeah. It depends on your situation. Right. You got, you got public transportation, good stuff like that. And other things, trains, trains are big. I feel like do you have trains. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I have a, uh, I use the, the BART to get in and out of San Francisco. It's great. I've never actually lived in a place that had half decent public transportation. So that's brand new to me, but, um, having a strong conversation, transportation infrastructure, uh, is awesome. And it can allow people to not have to spend on things like vehicles where they're dropping 500 to a thousand bucks a month on, um, car payment, insurance, gas, and maintenance. It like it really adds up. Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference. You can you can store that wealth now and uh, deploy that capital in other ways, which is nice. And that's why I sold my cars so I don't have to worry about it. Would I like to be driving a sports car again? Yeah, sure. It'd be it'd be awesome. I'd love to do that. But I'm going to uh, lower my time preference and get a really dope sports car in a decade, I guess. Yeah, hang tight. This yeah, I'm just gonna hang in there, you know. Um, and did you talk about this earlier about the Japanese art? I did. I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you mentioned about the, uh, cause it, did you mention the 4 billion? No, go into it. I was going to say like, um, so like the lost decade in Japan was the nineties and basically cause the markets never recovered. It, it just plummeted. It literally peaked like I think January, 1990. Um, and then it just plummeted for a whole decade and it's never even got there back. It's like, the Nikki T25 is half what it was right like right now. It's around half what it was at night, the peak. So it got insane. But it talks about here about at the peak of the market in 1990, Japan imported more than four billion worth of art, including nearly half of all impressionist art that was on the market. Of course, the art market plunged along with Japan bubble, Japan's bubble economy in the early 1990s. And yeah, it just plummeted. And then in 2001, Japan was the first government to introduce quantitative easing and that's where we see japan now like they just own everything their whole their, the, the bank of japan just owns everything so when when assets deflate it's just going to be a big issue for them that's as simple as that they're just going to implode like what what happens to japan's financial system i don't know yeah it um it's uh, yeah and i fear for seeing that here in the u.s um, 
from all the QE that was done in the last decade. And I, I really would prefer if we didn't do that again now, <laughs> just cause I, I, like, I don't want to kick the can down the road and make it worse on everybody, especially, you know, friends, family, loved ones. Like, it's just not cool. If you got to rip the bandaid off, let it rip off, like stop messing with the global interest rates and let this ship correct its course so that we can all become more productive and, you know, <laughs> just move forward. It's too much has been distorted and, you know, entrepreneurs can't provide, can't perform economic calculation because they don't know what's going to work. If they can borrow at 0% or raise a billion dollars for an idea that's not that great or for a new business and they keep running that for years and years and years and all of a sudden when you raise interest rates, that business model no longer makes sense. Well, that's malinvestment and it shouldn't have happened in the first place and we need sound money so that entrepreneurs can know what to do. They can, the free market will let them know what will work and what won't work because if it doesn't work, they'll go and solve it and they will go out of business and then everybody can learn from that mistake and move forward. So we can have the best shit at the best prices for everyone. Look at, I mean, just look at the Nikkei Chi Chi 5 and I wish I could go back farther because it was even lower before that, but it's just like a rocket ship here in the eighties. I mean. And Japan was booming then. That was a big deal. And then obviously. Right. They got wrecked. Yeah. And they've never recovered. Um, yeah. Like if, if you don't, if, if you don't um, know that or have gone back to look, you would, you would think that they had recovered all that. And then some, right. You know, we've, we're, we're back above where we were in 2008 and, you know, nobody thinks anything of it, but um, yeah, like they're still catching up from there. And if you count all the inflation that they've um, had since then, you're you're still pretty much underwater. Yeah, it's it's all bad, dude. It's like there's just so many things that like okay, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those things won't exist for us. They're they're done. Right. I mean, supposedly Social Security 2034 is runs out fund funding, and then 2026 for um, Social Security, or not Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so it's a big issue. Like, yeah, it is. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, planning on having those services available to me when I can start using them because they won't be around. Uh, that's my guess, but also like you need to be prepared for those things to not be there. Um, you should not be reliant on, on that at all. You need to Make as much money as you can without working to death. Save as much of it as you can. Stay healthy. Um, learn great skills so that you can provide for yourself and your family. Right? Like, I don't want to be retiring in 40 years or 30 years and be like, oh, man, I hope my Social Security is enough to pay for me to survive for three more decades because I didn't I didn't save anything because I, I thought Social Security would just take care of it for me. You know? Dude, it's... You have to be ready for that. Yeah, it's it's fucked. Um, it really is. Because uh, the reality is, is like, think about how many Americans are on that right now. And like, so like, that's not, you know, I don't think that's going to change like overnight. Uh, and that's going to become an issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely not going to change overnight. And I hope that, um, I hope that the sound money narrative like makes its way to mainstream. So, Everybody can kind of get with the program, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. And also everyone should thank CH for the life advice because that was valid, solid, very simple life advice. <laughs> yeah. I try not stay to give healthy. too much advice, but yeah, stay healthy. But like, <laughs> like I don't know, that, simple. Seems, that seems like a, like a pretty simple one. Like, yeah, you know, like be as healthy as you can try to live as long as possible and you know, take care of your, your friends, family, yourself and uh your loved ones and you can do like it's not that complicated yeah. just work hard save up as you can like don't order a ton of stuff on amazon every week it's like little stuff that kind of adds up where you realize i don't even know how much money i pissed away on amazon in the last year for stuff that I, or this last couple of years that i didn't need and i really think twice about what i need when i go on there um because i I'm, I'm going to need that money for the future for either stacking sats or something else. It's, 
it's not that complicated. You don't get back all that materialistic stuff. Like it, it never works out. Yeah, that's it's a valid point there. Be smart with your money. What do you think? Should we talk about the uh, the flash crash? Yeah, might as well hop in there. I'm just pulling up the bitstamp chart. That's why I wasn't saying anything. Right. I was just trying to find it because that's what led the crash. It's, might as well go to the one minute. All right. Going to the one minute here. Because, you know, why not view it on one minute? I should pull up the, uh, so here's the chart for the uh, XBX index versus exchange ticks. And long story short, Bitstamp led the crash, just a giant sell wall basically, just ate up all the bids down to, looks like 6178 says there. So literally 18.69%, basically almost bear market if we are talking in market terms. I don't know what you consider. I just always laugh because that's how Bitcoin is. It just does these things, but th this really drove. Um, so for the XBX index, um, and so on Bit, excuse me, Bitmax. I was gonna say Bitstamp, but on Bitmax, there's the index is basically made up of two exchanges now, which is Coinbase Pro and Bitstamp. And since Bitstamp absolutely tanked, it dragged down the uh, Bitmax Bitcoin index. So obviously that. Definitely ran a lot of stops and here again just ate up and just fucked up the whole market. And that's why we saw this huge crash. I mean, it was pretty ridiculous, but pretty funny to watch. And it says Bitcoin's at 8180. I haven't looked at it recently, but did it just jump or something? Or is that just me? I have I have no clue. I haven't looked. I was I was really zoomed out. So you know when you're like zoomed out in like two weeks or something just really ridiculous. Oh here it is. And you just no, not, yeah. you, you can't I need to zoom in a little more. Yeah, no, it's just one giant cell wall. Right. So, um, I mean, those are all really good points. Pretty much you had that big cell wall on on Bitrix, uh, uh, Bitstamp, I mean. And, you know, BitMEX is, what are they, 50, they're 50% weighted? to. Yeah, it's 50-50 to, it's 50, yeah. 50 now because there's only two exchanges. I think Kraken was the other one before, and it said it got removed. A while yeah. back, I can't remember when, but it got removed for whatever reason. I don't, I don't remember the exact reason, but it's uh pretty interesting to see that. Like, this is pretty insane. Like, just I mean, I couldn't imagine if you saw this in person, just dink, 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 dink. Like, I mean, look yeah. at that. Like, that's like it just dropped like two thousand dollars almost. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I, I I was up watching it, and I like I've seen it happen before. So I was kind of ready and I got a couple of DMS and some people were like, it's over. Here comes the crash. Like we're going back to three K. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. I was like, I think it's a flash crash. And now we're back up above. Like, dude, that, yeah, that, look, so, look at that. It's like, just straight it, March down. Dude, just dun, 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 dun. Like every order, like to think about that, that's just so much just whoosh, gone. Yeah. And, and that's then, a good point. I want to, uh, on that topic, I wanted to read a, a couple of tweets here. One was from Jack Mallers. He's the creator of the Zap Wallet, if you didn't know. But he uh, he really knows his shit with with financial markets and, and infrastructure, especially from a, from a trading standpoint. And he was saying, in his opinion, uh, it had less to do with thin order books and more to do with the poor infrastructure. So uh, no matter the book depth, um, the market is sophisticated enough to react to such blatant orders. So the issue was with Bitstamp's engine couldn't execute market buys and was started skipping orders that low. So in other words, had Bitstamp's, um, Bitstamp's infrastructure been better and more up to the likes of, um, your traditional exchange where you know trillions of dollars are being traded you wouldn't have had that big of a drop because the orders would have executed fast enough where it didn't matter and uh they would have those buy orders would have been soaked up quickly but you know this is this is bitcoin that we're talking about where it's a drop in the bucket 100, 100 we're pumping billion. right now i'm just gonna say that <laughs> like yeah. as we talk i just thought it was pretty funny because this is like, it's getting active again is what's going on. Yeah. And this is, uh, yeah. And this is where it gets interesting. And 
you, you've seen a flash crash. You can tell the activity starting again. I remember the flash crashes in 2017. Um, I also think that it's not a surprise that you're seeing these things during market activity. And as again, like price drives adoption, and you could even see it with uh, the mempool filled up. So the mempool is like, you know, the, the bucket of transactions that are looking to be confirmed on the Bitcoin blockchain. And I, I was moving um, I was moving some BTC around and it took like two or three days to confirm. Why? Well, because the mempool was like totally full and uh, I sent it with like a super low transaction fee and I didn't need it to go through right, right away. And eventually it confirmed and it confirmed right when the mempool cleared up. So uh, it's funny because you can see the fee market of the blockchain like play out in real time. Like if you want your shit confirmed, you can you can pay for it, and no one's and you don't have to ask permission for that. You can do it. You want your transaction going through right now? You need to send um, BTC to Bitmax or your hardware wallet, and you need it there right now. You can pump up your fees and get it. Um, and if you're willing to wait for it, you can pay a lower fee. And the fee market's working great. And, a, and it really shows when the price is pumping, like it is right now. It wouldn't surprise me if the mempool starts to maybe fill up again and for my DMs to start blowing up because we're maybe we're pumping right now. Uh, bro, you aren't using XRB? <laughs> no, but uh, it's pretty interesting, like looking at the sidebar over here. You can you might be able to see it, uh, CH, but like, the BTC pairs are getting racked, like with the alt, but the USD pairs are up quite a bit. So obviously, for most part, I mean XRP, XBT is up a little bit. It's only up like one point nine percent versus fourteen percent in USD, which is pretty interesting. And that's just like as Bitcoin's moving, and so like alts are getting, even if they are doing good against the US dollar, they're getting wrecked in Bitcoin. Is what it's yeah, happening. yeah, um, I yeah. I try not to tell anybody what to do from a trading standpoint to be very careful, but make sure everybody is measuring their charts relative to BTC because a lot of I spent a lot of time looking at USD charts, not realizing that um, had I been holding Bitcoin instead, like I, I would be doing better. You know yeah. what I mean? A lot of people right. aren't using BTC as their um, base currency, and you really should. So please be careful with that. Yeah. The bounce though. <laughs> uh oh, I think Ripple's going to five hundred dollars. It's like Twitter. <laughs> you see these people, dude. It's like there's like there's just like a whole bot army of XRP people on Twitter. The T the TRX army is gone, dude. That was a thing. It was so funny how bad that was at one point. There was like a two a couple month period. I think you cut out there. Oh yeah. No, I was Can just, you still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. No, I was just saying how bad that could you you heard me, I assume, saying how bad the whole like TRX XRP army thing got. Yeah, yeah. And these things are Yeah, just... I, I almost I hope that doesn't I, I don't want another alt season just because I don't want to deal with that. Cause it's a whole different problem to deal with. <laughs> like trying to convince people. I'm like, no, no, no. Like this has happened before it's happened in 2013. It's going it to happen in 2017. Again. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, I don't want to have to convince somebody to be like, you need to time it so that you sell the top or else you're, you're fucked. Dude, do you remember ZL? Oh, look at the ZCL. Do you remember this? When it went from Z classic, Z classic. Cause it got like, I don't know what the pump was over. Oh, Ethereum, remember Z Classic Ethereum fork or something? Dude, it went from 410 sats to, I don't even know. It went a lot up in that. I don't even know what that is. I could check what it is, but it's going to be a scary number. Yeah, I mean. It's, 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 this was the stupidity. Well, and like here again, that's the example of like just excess liquidity in the system. Yeah, it's it's very obvious when you see people looking for yield, and uh, I understand the emotional attachment to, um, you know, altcoin bags and trying to oh, you know, BTC is too expensive. I'll never get rich or whatever, and you want to look for that hundred x pump over the weekend and 
convert back to BTC or fiat or whatever. And like, it's not easy, you know? <laughs> yeah. This, it's, this thing's retarded. I remember, it's, I remember when it happened, it went like from nothing to 200 and something, something ridiculous number. That was, that was insane. I don't mean to talk about it, but it's just, it's insanity. What, happened and the only thing i'll say is the problem is is when bitcoin goes so do the alts go it's just for the most part they'll still go up in usd they get direct the tide because bitcoin gets more expensive so i mean it's just the inevitability of a lot of what happens right you see that liquidity spill over to other assets yeah it just yeah 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 it's just no right That's it's kind of like the stock market where there's just that the rotation you see it's kind of a similar thing, um, and that's what like that's why like when we saw like there's a very good thing when they showed but like when Bitcoin hit its peak in twenty twenty thousand like the alts most alts did not peak then most altcoins peaked early January like end of December early January uh, where Bitcoin peaked like December what was twenty first something like that twentieth twenty first yep and so. And like the alts didn't finish peaking until I want to say the the last one probably peaked like the first week of January. But like, so it took a while for that liquidity just to spill over. And then it just went ridiculous for the altcoins, the altcoins, because what are people doing? With, you know, the Bitcoin dumping into the alts and then the fucking things went nuts. Right, right. I mean, or, you know, or people were buying Bitcoin, obviously, and dumping them into alts because they, you know. It just was, it was insanity is what it was. I mean. Yeah, I, that, um, I like that line of thinking, you know, I'm, I'm making the assumption that there wouldn't be an alt season because people aren't dumb enough to fall for that again. But when you think about it from a, I guess like a liquidity standpoint, like, or excess capital, right? Yeah. If you, if there's all this excess capital that, um, is created because the fiat price of Bitcoin has um, done, it has gone exponential, then that excess capital might need a place to go. And as it takes a few weeks or months for that to spill over, that spills into the same asset class, if you, for lack of a better term. And you, that's where you see that, that, that pump from, from the alt side. Uh, it's just so violent the way it moves it's I, I mean i've totally gotten out of that game i don't even care yeah. to try to speculate on it anymore because what I'm, I, I'm gonna end up with less btc it's just it's not fun for anybody when that happens um and i i give a lot of credit for those who are and i Venturing. understand that it's fun right? <laughs> like i like i get it i give everybody credit for for you know playing that game uh, it's it's not easy it's just like i i think i value my satoshis too much probably because i spent the last two years every single day trying to understand bitcoin sound money austrian economics that uh now i just i look at my my bitcoin i'm like well i don't want to give you up for anything right now um even if yeah. it's to try to make more bitcoin um no it makes and, sense yeah like i it's it, it's something I know that I'm going to wind up with less and I don't, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. No, a hundred percent makes sense. I'm just laughing at the fact that it's happening. And like, for instance, Litecoin's like what? $95 now or something. Right. It's Litecoin's up like, yeah, it's $95 right now. It's up a shit ton from when it, um, bottomed. It's up like three or four times. So it's, it's running again. Like alts it's, I don't know what happens next. It would be scary to think of having another alt season, to be honest. Very scary because that's, that means what? Crypto goes to a trillion mm -hmm. plus. I mean, yeah, think about that's... It, crypto will go multi trillion if that happens, dude. Because Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin's going to reach an insane number and then all coins will get dragged up with it because they trade in Bitcoin and Bitcoin's price will be dragged up. So the fiat skews things even worse. That's where right. you said the fiat skews. That's because. Okay, now think about it. If you have 10 Bitcoin and 10 Bitcoin and one Bitcoin's worth a million dollars, well, guess what? Everyone's going to have a shit ton of altcoins. It's just, I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but like the excess liquidity is going to be there. $10 million still hasn't really inflated that much. You know what I mean? That's right. still like, I, I could be wrong, but like the spillover happens. Like, if, if Bitcoin's, yeah. a, like, if everything's priced in Bitcoin, that just changes everything. Right.
And uh, I really can't wait for the unit of account status day when I'm thinking in sats. But um, yeah, the, the spillover happens. It is what it is. There's nothing you or I can do about it except yeah. like <laughs> stay prepared for that yeah. kind of activity. And, and it is what it is. But um, yeah, you're right that if the, the pump continues – in 2019 into 2020 or however long it lasts and things do get a little crazy, we're going to see uh, maybe that $1 trillion market cap for, I guess, all of cryptocurrencies, even though I, I don't like the, I don't like that metric because you and I could start beef and Bitcoin coin right now. And uh, you know, I could sell one to you for a dollar and we have, a hundred million of them and our market caps a hundred million right so like you can you can really game that metric but yeah don't be surprised when when people start referring to this asset class in the trillions come come the next pump which would make sense because what was the if you recall off the top of your head 833 or 834 billion according to coin market cap so i don't know if that's right or wrong but it was yeah right Somewhere around there. Okay, and then in two thousand and one, what was the what was the market cap of the Nasdaq? It was like Mark seven trillion. trillion. Yeah. Okay. Market, right. It was like it was more than a few trillion. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was it was pretty big and ridiculous. Obviously. Yeah. Okay, so that's fifteen ish years ago. Seven, actually closer to twenty. Um, it wouldn't if you think Fuck. the, the twenty the years bursting, ago. Yeah, like if you're thinking the bursting. Fuck. um cryptocurrency market cap bubble of 800 trillion is uh was a lot you ain't seen nothing yet when bubbles start bursting when market caps are in the trillions that's when you really see some shit start to go down um so i want to make sure i'm staying ready for that the next time around as as it happens and we're going to be recording as it's happening so hopefully we can both remind each other yeah um, i i i don't know it's what happens next? No, I don't know. If 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 it really does get retarded again, because no matter what, if Bitcoin goes up in price, like if the fiat term is stupid, like even just like think about okay, hundred k, okay, well that's gonna, there's going to be spillover into alts no matter what, because there's just going to be like, oh wow, that dude who's owned Bitcoin since ten bucks, now he has a shit ton. You know what I mean? Right. Like, what do you do I'm, with that capital? Yeah, it has to go somewhere. I'll tell you where mine's staying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying like, no, you're right. You're there's, right. there's like <laughs> shit power of the shit coins and it not in the power of shit coins. It's just, it's just spillover. It's the same thing as any markets. It's somewhere else to move it. And it's pretty funny what's happening. It's getting ridiculous. That's what's going to happen most likely. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. We'll be here to try to give a play by play as it's happening. What do you think? Is that a good spot to wrap this? Uh, yeah, we can. I mean, we could we could mention just quickly the global political risk. Donald Trump did just tweet about something about Iran, and then we like we annihilate them. So I think political risk is just not being priced in. I'm just saying this to finish off this before the end. Mm. So it's it's something worth mentioning. Like political risk is not being addressed, and it's going to only get worse. I feel like currently, like the trade war has been. It's pretty much off now, it seems like, at least in the short term, like for the next few months. And we've had markets that have rallied on it for basically a year on the idea that there trade there'd be a trade deal. But in the reality of everything, it is just simply a rising power contesting a current power. That's all. Right. Uh, it's your you know typical market forces. And it's everybody's just got to watch it and, and take notice. But um. It's no surprise that that wouldn't be priced in yet because I I don't know how big of a talking point it is yet. And my only evidence of that is just from, you know, listening to people who are closer to retirement age um, at the office who are, you know, this one guy mentions it all oh, the trade war. It's nothing like we'll we'll get through it like we usually do. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you're right. We'll get through it. But. Like what happens between now and we'll get through it? I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't yeah. really know, and I don't want, I, I, I don't want him to be thinking like, oh, his his four hundred one k bags are are packed and they're not going to go down 
in price um, because of, you know, the, uh, the trade war just working itself out. Like I'm like, it's been two decades of, of this stuff, like just working out. And that's what it, they've been told. It's not going to yeah, be down. Like, and right. Right. I, I just want to say something because I, I know an older person that mentioned this to me the other day, like they were told don't sell till 30,000 and by 30,000, he was referencing the Dow Jones hitting 30,000. And I was like, well, I was like, motherfucker, like, if we don't have a trade war deal, like this is, I, I love it all. I was like, there's no trade war deal. There's no 30,000 coming. 30,000 ain't happening. Boeing's dead. <laughs> like, nobody wants to fly an Air Max 737 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's listen, some... everybody's, everybody wants to defend their bags. Like, I, I get it. I'm going to defend mine until the day I die. So but, like, I. <laughs> but you can see, like, he, like this, like this Gosh. guy in particular, he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about sound money. No. He doesn't know anything about, um, that, that asset prices have been inflated. And I hear these people talk and there are people who have bought real estate in California over the past few decades. And they're, and I hear this every day at the office, like when you're ready, when you can afford it, make sure you buy something. Cause, and quote, real estate prices always go up in California. Yeah. End quote. And well, I'm like, that's I'm, a, that's a belief. And I understand why. If you bought you houses know, in the eighties, they're yeah. what, I mean, 20 X and we're, we're, like, could you imagine like what the prices no, of homes in some areas? Are no, I, I can't imagine. But it's it's a, a belief and a truism that yeah, regardless of the price that you buy in California, that real estate will always rise in price. And I'm like, you better be careful with that because the majority of your net worth is sitting in that home. And in the off chance that you're wrong and that asset prices have been inflated, especially in a place like California – um, you need to be really careful because you might not be able to dump those bags to mm. a next generation of buyer who can't afford a million dollar home, like in a all right neighborhood, right? Yeah. Like, th like there needs to be a, a a buyer on the other side of that transaction. And if those aren't there, what happens? Uh, the prices decrease until you have buyers that step in and want to be the other side of that transaction. And that might be lower than you think when you're going to unload. Now, if inflation is really picking up, you know, does that offset it a little bit? Maybe, but then your purchasing power is still decreased. Um, so if you sold a house 20 years ago for a million dollars and you're selling a house today for a million dollars, you definitely would rather be the dude who sold it 20 years ago for a million because hopefully you, you use that money um, wisely to, to uh, grow your wealth. But I don't, I don't know. It's... All I was gonna say is like, so we de we delinked from gold in what nineteen seventy one here, and then consumer price inflation just goes or index, but you know inflation goes ridiculous in the seventies, post Vietnam War, and then on top of that, you know dealing from gold, and from there, that's when you know interest rates peaked in like nineteen eighty eighty one, and since then they've always been decreasing pretty much for the most part overall trend, and there's been extreme money printing and what do you would you what would you look stocks have went insane so yes people who have been investing here have a bias of long term but what they don't understand is if they don't understand some money that skews everything right and that you know you you can't assume that keeping interest rate interest rates low um has no repercussions in the future and and they do but that maybe they don't remember um, what happened in the seventies, they have uh, a short memory of all the inflation that was seen and, um, the rising of in interest rates. Like I, it, it blows my mind to think that someone even bought a house with like a 15% rate. Like, I'm mean, how could you even afford a home? Like that sounds like a lot. And the only reason I think that is because I've only been alive at a time when interest rates have been substantially lower than that. Like I, it, it doesn't even make sense to me that interest rates would ever have been that high, but it's a totally different environment and it absolutely was the case. Um, and that doesn't mean that we won't see something like that again. And could you imagine if rates were that high? Like nobody would be able to buy anything. It would no. just be over. That's, it would be done. No, there'd be nothing. I don't, I don't know where we go next, but I think people's ways of life is going to change pretty drastically because there's like central banks that completely failed. This is what happened. They never stopped printing. And if the thing collapses now, where do you go next? You can't. There's, 
they've used up their ammunition. Like what what happens next? I don't know. It's not good though. Yeah, yeah. All that they're out of uh, they're out of things to do to try to curb that. And I, I hope if they do attempt something like that, you'll see people speak up about it. Yeah, I don't um, think we'll take. I don't think people will deal with it again. I think after yeah. the past second, I don't think in. That again, there's that political risk that we, you know, keep seeing, and that Jesse Colombo, uh, paranoid, paranoid bullet just for a lot on uh, Twitter. It's it's everywhere. It really is, and no one's talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think uh, you know, you can keep uh, keep researching, learn as much as you can, stack sats, pack your lunch, do all that stuff to. Uh, <laughs> to be prepared and take advantage for everything that's going on around us. It's never been a better time to be um, thinking about sound money and what that means for the future. Yeah, you're 100% correct about that because I think this fiat experiment is coming to an end here shortly. Yep, and uh, I can't wait to to see it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm an interested at the same time I'm scared because the society we know now is not uh, sustainable in yeah. some sense yeah we're so just going to have to uh, default yeah right and that's everyone is just going to have to deal with that and hopefully everybody has uh, been thinking about this for a little while and just did what they had to do to uh, per- stay prepared you would be correct about that there uh, it'll be interesting and I think that'd be a good way to wrap it up and leave the listeners was a good thing to think about over the weekend or whenever they listen to this. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This was episode 19. Uh, give us a shout on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we did have a few reviews come in. We do appreciate that. Thank you very much for the reviews. Um, you know, send this to anybody, share it. We really do appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Yep. Thank you for listening.